I have something to confess. My name is Craig, and I'm a Sabbatarian. If you're not familiar with that word, then that will sound strange, and you'll start to wonder what sort of fella is this. If you are aware of Sabbatarianism, then perhaps you're downloading all the kids' assumptions about it, and perhaps even about me. Well, let me join you in that. In Northern Ireland, the Sabbath Sunday has been a changing and contested day of the week. A quick recollection will show us the controversies about work and the Sabbath. It's about our free pea cousins chaining up the swings in the parks on a Sunday because you couldn't possibly go to the park on the Lord's Day. Perhaps you grew up in a house where the TV was not allowed on a Sunday or you weren't allowed to kick a ball in the park. I remember one minister saying that all he was allowed to do on a Sunday was take his tennis ball for a walk. Then it became about Sunday trading, didn't it? We limit that to about six hours on a Sunday as if the other six days cannot contain all of our shopping needs. Recently, it was about the Belfast Marathon being run on a Sunday. Our own moderator at the time, Stafford Carson, said this. It was reported the moderator warned that many churchgoers do not want to take part in sporting events on a Sunday. He also said that the race could disrupt travel to church services. He said this, If the marathon starts at its usual time, this will clash directly with morning services, resulting in congestion and difficulty for people traveling to and from their place of worship. It goes on and on. There's so much of the old-fashioned sensitivity around what many think of as the Sabbath. I don't really care about much of that because I'm a Sabbatarian. And I try to be a Sabbatarian in the biblical sense. The Bible says this about the Sabbath day. From Exodus 20, Remember the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. Six days shall you labor and do all your work. But at the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord. On it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner, the traveler who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy, made it different. Most of us know that one, don't we? It jives with a lot of what we've just said, rule-keeping, no work, no fun type of Sabbath. And that's how many naturally read it. But the Bible also says this about, this was our call to worship this morning. If you turn back your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, and the holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it, not going your own ways, or seeking your own pleasure, or talking idly, then you shall take delight in the Lord, and I'll make you ride on the heights of the earth. See, that steps us away from the rule-keeping way of thinking and walks us into something we all want, delight and rest. One of these views is about the head. The other is about the heart. So I'm a Sabbatarian in the sense that I long to meet with God's people in God's presence, to hear God's word, and then to do God's will. Once we've done that, gathered together, heard from God, then our benediction is pronounced, and the close of our service happens, and it's done. That is the Sabbath. I would have Sabbathed with you. We come together, we pause, we worship. That's a remarkable invitation. God's Sabbath rest is never to be reduced to issues about the buying of milk or what I do if I get a flat tire on the way to church. That's a long way, perhaps, of saying that this miracle we have this morning with the man with the withered hand isn't so much about his hand as it is about the Sabbath. 
This is the power of Jesus then as Lord of the Sabbath. We have to dig deeper on this. Let's do that together. Let's talk about controversy. Controversy around the Sabbath is nothing new. It's not an ordinary invention. Jesus faces it on more than one occasion. In fact, in the little paragraph just before our passage this morning, we have a very good example of that. It says this, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain and eat. When the Pharisees saw this, They said to him, look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath. He said to them, have you not read what David did when he was hungry? And those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which it was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests. Or have you not read in the law how the Sabbath, the priests in the temple profane it and are guiltless? I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. And if you'd known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. That last phrase is key this morning. The Son of Man, Jesus, is Lord of the Sabbath. That's like a hinge between the incident with the grain and the one about to come with the man's withered hand. They both raise an eyebrow about the Sabbath. Now what we cannot do with a passage like this is justify our Sunday preferences. Some take it that way, both inside the walls of the church and outside of them too. Inside, a list of rules and regulations gets added to God's delightful Sabbath. You have to shine your shoes on a Saturday night. The car gets petrol before Sunday. Even the idea of a Sunday best outfit speaks to the human rules and regs. Those have nothing to do with the Sabbath and little to do with Jesus. Outside the church, People might justify the fun run, the local park run, swimming lessons, gymnastics classes, or just taking the morning off. Many act as if there were no special quality to Sunday or to the Sabbath call to come and rest and worship with God's people and with him. Inside, outside, both paths are in error because we quickly forget that this is Jesus, and there's no one like him. As such, no one shares in his lordship of anything, particularly the Sabbath day. Remember the hinge of the passage here, please. The Son of Man, Jesus, is Lord of the Sabbath. And that unique authority is displayed with the man with the withered hand. Let's talk about him. In some ways, this miracle is very matter of fact. We simply read earlier, he went on from there, the grain fields, entered their synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him, the Pharisees again? He says to them, which one of you who has a sheep, if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value is a man than a sheep. So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out. And it was restored healthy like the other. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. The real heart of the passage in question is not the hand or the miracle. It's the question, is it lawful? to heal on the Sabbath. And Jesus says yes in two ways. The first is in what he says. Which one of you who has a sheep, if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. What seems terribly obvious to us there angers the Pharisees who ask the question. 
So there's something else happening here. We get the gist. A man is worth more than a sheep. So he's more important than the sheep. And you're allowed to go rescue an animal. That's fine. Fair enough then to rescue and do good to a man. But don't think of the sheep as a random choice here. This is well-worn language for the people of Israel. From David's, the Lord is my shepherd, to the people who all alike sheep have gone astray. This is always a, a powerful metaphor. This man is not more valuable because he is a different species, but because he's a different kind of sheep. He's sitting in the synagogue and therefore is one of the sheep of Israel, one of God's flock. So this is not a license, you see, to do whatever you like on a Sunday. This is the power of Jesus as Lord of the Sabbath to care for his sheep, to look after his people. Is that how we think of Sunday? Those are powerful words. The second yes from Jesus is in his actions. He says to the man, stretch out your hand, and the man stretched it out. It was restored healthy like the other. That is uh, simply proof of Jesus' words and his Sabbath authority. Notice there's nothing said about the cripple's faith. This is the change in presentation of the miracles. They're always about Jesus, but more and more they reveal who he really is. Now that gets something of a strong reaction. The Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. Now that alone should help us see the authority that Jesus speaks and acts with. The Pharisees see it and they react with violence. That is their tragedy. Our tragedy is that we don't get an incident like this at all. This draws little to no reaction from us. That is our tragedy, that in case we would stand in judgment of the Pharisees. That's a comment perhaps on the relaxed or hyper-legal approaches we take to the Sabbath day. That is for our condemnation this morning. We must take a long look in the mirror and really see Jesus at the center of the church and as the focus of the Sabbath, not ourselves. What to do then? Where do we go from here? Well, we need real Sabbath rest. What we're compelled to do here is to rethink, reassess our attitude to Jesus and his lordship of our Sunday services and our Sabbath days. When we think in the limited Ten Commandments sense about the Sabbath, we end up being rule keepers and rule makers, the Sabbath police. And that's the worst way to approach it. But if we put Jesus at the center of our Sabbath thinking, then everything changes. And I mean everything. The Sabbath didn't originate, you see, in Exodus with the Ten Commandments. As they state themselves, it is a creation feature. God rested after his creation work. After Egypt, the people were to give their slaves the day of rest since they themselves have been rescued from slavery. And Jesus says in our passage that he is the son of man. That is his favorite title for himself. It's a nod and a wink perhaps to Daniel. In Daniel's many visions, he sees one like a son of man who is really quite special. It says in Daniel 7, I saw in the night visions... And behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Uh, dominion there, authority over the beasts and the animals should remind us of Adam. And the Son of Man then, Jesus, 
is a second Adam. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians. The first Adam became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Now what we have there is a very important way of putting our Bibles together. We go from creation to Adam's dominion, to the fall of that authority, to the punishment of slavery, to the rescue from Egypt, and then the giving of the Sabbath as a sign of rest and rescue. From there, we go to Jesus, the Son of Man, the second Adam, who starts a new world and a new heavenly rest, a new Sabbath. Now, that is too important for us to miss. Let me say it again. Forgive me for doing so, but it's really, really important. When you hold your Bible, we go from creation to Adam's authority, to the fall from that authority, punishment of slavery, rescue from Egypt, the giving of the Sabbath, that's rest and rescue, to Jesus, the Son of Man, the second Adam, who starts a new world and a new rest. Sabbath rest, today and in the future, is built on Jesus. Two options then lie before us. One is narrow, and it misses the point. This is the world of no TV, no ball games, Sunday best, no work, no fun. The other is broad and full of blessings and delight. Freedom to worship together. The joy of our Jesus songs. The life-changing word of God. The fellowship we look forward to with one another. And the long lasting, heavenly rest won by Jesus and kept for us. You know, this sermon is essentially a long way of repeating what Hebrews 4 tells us. Let me finish with that. There remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. What a thing to look forward to. I wonder if we are really looking forward to the Sabbath day. Let's pray about these things. Father, we have forgotten the delights of being your people and being together on your Sabbath. Yes, we miss church. We miss one another. But make your son our focus, we pray. Change our hearts to want to delight in all you provide, and to delight in Jesus, who keeps the new Sabbath for us. Because of him, we enter a true rest that will eclipse all of our days off. Father, draw us back to you in his name. Amen.